Buenas tardes. Uh, with the presentation that uh, Bert Garcia made about uh, Luis Valdez, I don't think I need an introduction. Why don't I have Luis Valdez come up to the front and we're going to have a little dialogue <laughs> in which we're going to talk about some of the work that he published for us, El Machete of El Excentrico. Okay? Uh, you wrote a um, total of eight columns, which begins in January the 5th, and it goes all the way to May 5th. And, um, you know, basically, it's, it's their columns that discuss uh, culture, uh, acculturation, it discusses injustice. Uh, there's a lot of things. So we're going to take a little excerpts from some of the columns, okay? And, and and I'm gonna have some people, some of the students read, okay, some of the uh, some of the uh, parts of, a, of the first column, and, and and ask you to comment. What were your thoughts that were going on at that particular moment when you were writing this column? So Ariana, uh, Manso, why don't you come up to the microphone and read for us the column? El Excéntrico, January 5th, 1964. It was 1925 when Jose Vas Va Vasconcelos wrote those words. He was talking to a Mexico still crippled from 10 long years of fierce, chaotic, chaotic revolution. It is quite probable he was addressing your grandfather and mine. It is a fact they did not listen. Tired, worn out, disillusioned, your grandfather and mine turned away from La Patria. The dream had shriveled into a nightmare. Those, the words were back again. There were no use. Proforio Diaz had given out words as if they were silver pesos. He had lied. Francisco Madero had, dual, had doled out words as if they were hectares of soft, fertile land. He too had lied. What man can stomach words when his family is hungry? Leave those words. Leave the homeland. There are things a man must do for his sons and then be silent. For us born and reared on this side of the border, the Latinidad of our grandfathers must forever remain a mystery. They came and did what they had to do, and then indeed, they were silent. And yet, as children, perhaps, how many times did we not catch the old viejos looking directly at us from their corner of the room? What's wrong, abuelito? Nada, cabrón, nada. Then they would go outside, and we would hear them hack and cough and then spit. Later, when we went out to play, we would see the wad of yellow spit on the ground and seriously doubt that they ever rode with Pancho Villa or that Mexico was as wonderful as they said. Thank you. So clearly, we have, you know, family that comes from Mexico during the revolution, and there's a lot of nostalgia for Mexico, and there's a lot of anger I can detect on the near father that's he's calling you a cabron. You got in trouble for that. Well, with Daniel Santana, you know, as you as the the older generation reacted. Uh, well, you know, it's a difference between families. Some families are are more mal hablados than others. You know, my wife's family, my wife Lupe's family, is very respectful. They, I never heard them swear. I never heard my swagger or swagger swear. But my mother could swear like a sailor, you know what I mean? <laughs> and she often did. And, and my father, when he had his few drinks, could also do it. Uh, and my uncles. So we were a very swearing family. You know, swearing is like a, it's almost like a border thing. You know, my parents came from the U.S. Uh, border between Sonora and Arizona, Nogales. My dad was born in Nogales. Uh, my mother was born in Mammoth, Arizona, which is just inside the border. But uh, the thing is that uh, people along the border, has been my experience now, uh, have good reason to swear a lot more than people from other parts of the country. The farther south you go the, into the indigenous cities and towns, the, the, the more polite people get. In the north, son muy mal hablados, man, you know. The cabronazos, you know, back and forth, that's just the style. And, and so I incorporated that into the spirit of this article. But I was already, I mentioned in my retort to Senor Saldana, that I was writing as a poet, I was writing as a novelist, as a playwright, I wasn't writing as a journalist. Yeah. But let me say that, that, I mean, I think good manners is still uh, very important, you know, and uh, in my work I, 
even though I still use malas palabras, I try to put them in the frame that makes sense, you know, so that people don't get offended. Say, I meant to say this earlier, that I'm very impressed with the presentation that the students from LBLA did with the professors, including uh, mi amigo here, Gregorio. Uh, this wasn't around in 58 when I came. Okay, you gotta know that. The, the most articulate kind of Chicanos that I knew in the barrio were pachucos. You know, they were cool. And they were malablados too. But I, I incorporated that into Zutsu because that spirit of rebellion, even they got in trouble with the law, uh, was something that attracted me very much. I liked their anger and the way that they channeled it, the way that they turned it into language and the way that they turned it. And, and there was a consciousness there that, that went up to a point. <coughs> what a university education gives you is a much broader perspective. But let me say that the, the, the articulate nature of all these students that are coming out, professors, I, I'm amazed, actually. I'm amazed that you have this theater. I'm amazed that you're all here. You were here, obviously, uh, metaphorically or actually, uh, in 1958. Uh, there were 20,000 students on Saturday State in 1958. 200 of those were Spanish surnames. Perhaps 20 of those were Mexican-Americans. We called ourselves Mexican-Americans, you know. Two were Chicanos, and I was one of them. And my compadre Roberto Rubalcaba was the other, and that was it. And there were no Chicanos on campus. Chicano was a whole new thing. It was radical to call yourself Mexican. So all of that kind of came home to roost, you know, in, in, in the eccentrico. And I'll always be grateful to Humberto Garcia. I love the, the shot here of the Beacon publication, 1938. If it hadn't been for, for pioneers like Don Humberto, uh, I wouldn't have had a chance. Uh, we've been lifting each other little by little, generation by generation. And uh, literacy has been absolutely crucial to our advancement. And so the idea of being learning to write English and Spanish both, and then writing it down, was, was part of our liberation. We had to learn how to speak. We had to learn how to write. And so I'm very grateful to Humberto Garcia for approaching me and offering me the opportunity to write a column. I had to think about it twice, got a lot of homework and stuff, but I said, no, I need to do this. I need to do this because there's so much to say. And